To visit planet Earth, you will have to be born as a human child. A monochrome portrait of modern family dynamics, a World War II drama with a breathtaking premise and a French-accented homage to American filmmaker Michael Cimino. That's all coming up in today's film show. And for that, I'm joined by Lisa Nesselson. Hi, Lisa. Hello, Olivia. Now, we're starting with a familiar theme in cinema. That's adults and children getting to know each other. That's at the heart of this new release from writer-director Mike Mills. The film's called Come On, Come On. It stars Joaquin Phoenix as a reluctant babysitter for his nephew. Tell us more. Well, in recent years, we've seen Joaquin Phoenix play a vigilante veteran who kills people with a hammer in Lynn Ramsey's You Were Never Really Here, a role for which he inexplicably won Best Actor at Cannes about five years ago, and of course as the misunderstood title character with bad makeup and an attitude to match in Joker. So I guess it's downright restful to see him play a laid-back regular guy doing really not all that much in Come On, Come On. The only thing that gets killed here is time. Johnny, played by Phoenix, is a mild-mannered fellow who travels around the U.S. with a tape recorder, interviewing young people about their vision of the future for a radio station that must have very deep pockets. He's not all that close to his sister, but when she has to devote herself to her husband for a while, Johnny ends up taking care of his nephew, Jesse, even though he does not know the first thing about kids, with Detroit, New Orleans, New York, and uh, Los Angeles as the backdrop in rather gorgeous black and white. Grown-up and kid get acquainted in sometimes awkward, sometimes endearing incredible. Okay, well, let's take a look at that very visual uh, take on those sissies and the low-key adventure of Come On, Come On. There will be so much for you to learn and so much for you to feel. Sadness, joy, disappointment, and wonder. You will grow up, travel, and work. Over the years, you will try to make sense of that happy, sad, full, always shifting life you're in. And when the time comes to return to your star, it may be hard to say goodbye to that strangely beautiful world. So those interviews that Joaquin Phoenix's character does with young Americans, apparently they're improvised, not scripted. That's right. When I saw the film, I did not know that that's really Phoenix winging it uh, in character. Some of the young people he talks to are optimistic for the future, and some understandably believe that with climate change upon us, uh, they're probably screwed compared to previous generations. Mm, Joaquin Phoenix, boy reporter. <laughs> exactly. I had really liked Mike Mills's Beginners, in which Christopher Plummer gave a wonderful performance as a husband and father who widowed in his 70s decided to come out as gay and it was based on Mill's own late dad. So I had high hopes for this, but nothing about its very gradual relationship building really grabbed me. Okay, well, so sensitive but not sensational perhaps. <laughs> Our next film comes from Belgium and it's about bullying and how destructive that can be. It's called Amand in French and in English its title is Playground directed by Laura Wandel. I did hear good things about this at the Cannes Film Festival, Lisa. What did you make of it? Oh, well, this is as far as you can get from the tender mood of Come On, Come On. This is a terrific movie. It's a very convincing view of just how bad a childhood can be, right under the noses of the adults. Playground isn't so much a portrait of the schoolyard bullying as it is this sensory immersion straight into the heart of children abusing other children physically and emotionally. Two youngsters, seven-year-old Nora and her older brother Abel, are are dropped off at school by their father. They're clearly not enthusiastic about being there. Once school is in session, well, Dad is powerless to imagine, let alone buffer, the arbitrary cruelty afoot in this building and its playground. OK, well, let's take a look at Playground and hear from the young Maya van der Beek, who plays Nora. When we have issues with other people, the most common question we ask ourselves is, what did I do wrong? Do I need to tell someone or keep it to myself? Maybe if I keep it to myself, the situation will resolve itself later. Or if I tell someone, will it make the situation worse? These questions are all pretty heavy. Allez, 
veux rester avec toi. On jouera ce soir, d'accord Par ici Plus vite, plus vite, plus vite. Yeah, there's definitely something quite chilling about that mm. atmosphere. And I presume the whole school day isn't just about bullying. They get some education as well. <laughs> well, uh, this is this is shot almost entirely from the height of the protagonist. But interestingly, hardly any of the scenes depict classroom learning. For Nora and her brother, school is primarily a sequence of mini ordeals to be navigated and endured in the lunchroom, the pool, or on the playground. Fifteen minutes of screen time representing several days elapse before we see sulky Nora or a smile. She has finally acquired a few girlfriends to talk to and play with, and she feels good about belonging. And then Nora glimpses some of the older boys viciously dunking somebody's head in a toilet, and the victim is her brother. There's a code of non-snitching that resembles what movies have taught us about, you know, life in prison. What does alerting the authorities, as the actress said, improve the situation, and when does it make things worse? The film lasts just 72 minutes, but that's enough time to show how people who are mistreated may well turn to harming others just to have some semblance of control. And the implications are truly unnerving. Mm, does sound very affecting. Now, next to a film that, going on its title, sounds quite gentle, but it's anything but. Uh, Persian Lessons comes from director Vadim Perlman. It's set during World War II. Tell us a bit more about this. Well, as an English speaker who struggled for years to learn French, I tend to be sympathetic to uh, stories where learning or teaching a language is part of the plot. Persian Lessons takes the harrowing reality of the Nazi camp system and combines it with an ingenious survival tactic that is incredibly suspenseful in an out-of-the-frying-pan-into-the-fire sort of way. Argentine actor Nahuel Perez Biscayar is just the polyglot for the part of Gilles, a Jewish man who is rounded up by the Germans while trying to escape to Switzerland and is doomed to be summarily shot. But his life is spared because he claims that he's not Jewish, he's Persian, that his mother's from Belgium and his father from Iran. Now, this catches the interest of a high-ranking Nazi commandant at the nearest transit camp. He's a chef in civilian life who plans to move to Iran after the war to open a German restaurant and so wants to learn Farsi in preparation for his new life. So those unlikely puzzle pieces, they fit together very nicely. There's only one problem, and it's a big one. Gilles does not speak a word of Farsi. So in order to survive, he has to invent a language that he claims is Persian and somehow manage to remember each word he makes up and what it means. Oh my God, sounds impossible. Well, let's take a look at the harrowing atmosphere of Persian lessons. Nicht verfasst. Long, gabt runter die Achf ab. Es hat mir sehr gefallen, Herr Hauptschirmführer. Sag Klaus zu mir. Will ihn ja einfach umbringen. Was ist, wenn er abhaut? Nein, das hat noch keiner geschafft. Wo ist der? Gefangener, wer ist er du? An seiner Stelle warst du bereit, mit diesem Haufen Namenloser zu sterben? Sie sind nur namenlos, weil du ihren Namen nicht kennst. Aber sie sind kein bisschen schlechter als du. Wenn nicht, so sind sie keine Mörder. Ich bin kein Mörder. Du sorgst dafür, dass die Mörder gut speisen. Ich bin auch müde. Wovon? Von der Angst? So I reckon I could probably invent a word or two, <laughs> definitely not a whole language. How did the filmmakers invent an entire language? Well, the director, who was born in Ukraine but emigrated to Canada as an adolescent, worked with a Russian linguist to come up with 600 words and their definitions and a fake grammar to go with it. It's gibberish, but it's gibberish that Gilles can breathe life into. The film requires a certain amount of suspension of disbelief, but the acting is so good that the deepening in the midst of constant danger feels genuine and it builds to a conclusion that I find rather extraordinary. Well, it's certainly an extraordinary premise. Now, finally, we're moving to a tribute to American director Michael Cimino, who died in 2016. He only made seven films, but it was definitely a case of quality over quantity because those films included The Deer Hunter and Heaven's Gate, which famously bankrupted a Hollywood studio. There's a new French direct, uh, documentary sorry, called Michael Cimino, Un Mirage Américain, uh, an American Mirage, perhaps. Tell us about that film. Well, French critic and film historian Jean 
Jean-Baptiste Doré. He was for many years the film critic at Charlie Hebdo and accepted the Penn Award in America on behalf of the satirical paper after the slaughter of most of their core staff. Spent eight days in a car with Chimino back in 2010, driving thousands of miles together uh, to get a sense of the American West and Midwest that fueled Chimino's storytelling while Chimino told stories. The result was a profile that became a book. Torre, who shot this documentary in the winter of 2020, went back to visit the locations where Chimino's masterworks, The Deer Hunter and Heaven's Gate, were shot. He combines the late Chimino's tape-recorded voice with insightful, often delightful interviews with the people who still live in those locations and who share their memories of the film shoots and the impact they had. Famous directors like Oliver Stone and Quentin Tarantino weigh in, but it's the ordinary American story interviews who make the film so touching. It's also beautifully shot with a real eye for widescreen landscapes. And it turns out the French continue to hold Chimino in higher esteem than America does. He was never forgiven for the fact that Heaven's Gate drove the studio United Artists into bankruptcy. It's true. There are many French fans of his work. Lisa, thank you very much for that roundup this week. Here's a glimpse of the legacy of Michael Cimino as captured by French filmmaker Jean-Baptiste Torre. Do remember you can get more movie news on our website. We're on social media too. There's more news coming up on France 24 just after this. Everyone talks about his rise and his fall and I kind of don't want to go into that. I'd rather just talk about the work itself rather than talk about the politics of this happening versus that happening. This guy went walking by with him with a clipboard. He said, hey you, work in a steel mill? I said, yeah. He said, do you hunt deer? I said, yeah. Can you speak Russian? And I said, yeah, which I can't. I can't speak Russian. And it does reflect on us. It does show a lot of who we were and where we come from. France is famous for food, fashion, and when it comes to the winter months, skiing. Well, France is considered one of the top destinations in the world when it comes to winter sports, les sports, d'hiver, and it's a significant part of the country's tourism industry. Ski culture, though, is about much more than the slopes, and this being France, a lot of that has to do with food. But has skiing gotten too expensive, and how can resorts cope with climate change? Join us as we slalom through the ins and outs of French skiing. French Connections Plus, presented by Jeannie Godula and Florence Guilmino.